Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. We are so glad to be back. I'm joined now by Republican analyst Phil Harriman and Democrat Ethan Strimling. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. It's good to be, good back. To be back. We've yeah. been getting all these messages, people wondering where we are. Well, so. here's, here's the deal. Now that we're back on the air early Sunday morning, the weather on Sundays is going to be glorious. <laughs> all right, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Not hope. sure we have much to talk about either, right? <laughs> Among all the headlines, a big one in Maine politics. Governor Janet Mills taking a stance against the controversial push to create a consumer owned utility in Maine. If question three passes, Pine Tree Power would replace CMP and Versant. Mill says it's just too risky. Guys, there's obviously a lot of money at play here, mainly from CMP's parent company opposing this. Uh, is the governor right on this, Phil? Uh, I, I believe she is. We uh, have an independent utility company that's regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. That is their job to make sure they're meeting the public's needs at prices that are reasonable for the services they are providing. And I haven't seen yet an example of where uh, we, the people, by referendum, take private property and turn it over to the government or a, an authority to run and, and think it's going to be cheaper and more effective. But Ethan, there are consumer-owned utilities across the state in some communities. Yeah, I'm happy to. I'll, I'll bring Phil down to Kennebunkport, where they actually have one, and it's very effective at keeping lower rates and doing better for the environment. Look, it's not a surprise that Governor Mills did this. She vetoed the bill when it went through the legislature. She sided with CMP on all of these referendum uh, you know, she's on the side of the Chamber of Commerce around this stuff, but that's who she is. That's who she's always been. It's important to recognize that on the other side of this, one of the largest environmental, pretty moderate environmental group, the Sierra Club, just came out in support of uh, this. Bernie Sanders, very popular in the state of Maine, just came out in support of it. So uh, it's pretty clear what the lines are in terms of conservative business interests opposing it and progressives, moderates, Democrats supporting it. Yeah, you mentioned the opposition here. Obviously, this is some good news for them. Um, but both Our Power and the Maine Affordable Energy Coalition are responding to the news. Take a listen. Her decision to vote against uh, question three are the same reasons we hear from voters all across the state. It's going to be too expensive. It's going to introduce politics into the electric grid and probably lead to years, or in her words, maybe even decades of court battles. So we're not looking to politicians like Governor Mills to tell us how to vote this fall. We're looking at our electric bills, our neighbors, and the existing consumer owned utilities across Maine that are saving people money right now. All right, so I'll ask you both this question, buy it or don't buy it on each side. Uh, Ethan, we'll start with you on the, the CMP side of things, buy it or don't buy it? <laughs> I don't buy it. What the studies show is that our utility bills will go down by almost 400 bucks and we'd have a lot more uh, environmental impact in terms of reducing climate change. So certainly don't buy what CMP is selling. Our power side, buy it, don't buy it. I do buy it. Uh, you know, the, what they're putting forward is something we've seen in municipalities all over Maine and something we've seen in other states in Nebraska, and it's worked very well for almost 100 years. Phil, do you buy the argument uh, that the, the CMP side is? is I, I, I do. I, I think the CMP obviously has been suffering from their public relations image, and I think they're working very hard to restore that. But if you look at the heart and soul of the operation, it's not the people in the executive ranks, it's the men and women on the lines, literally on the lines, who bring our power to us. And I'm convinced that they're doing the very best job they can at a price that is, is affordable. I'm not buying the uh, other side because uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it is true, Ethan is right. You go to an isolated area like Kenny Bunk and you can find cooperatives around that work relatively well. But when you scale that to the entire state of Maine, I think that's an entirely different uh, skill set and leadership need. It's uh, clearly been a good summer. He just said I was right. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get that? Is that on tape? We'll see what the voters think. <laughs> we will. And speaking of elections, a lot of talk now about no labels. That's the organization trying to break away from Democrats and Republicans and put forward an alternative candidate in the 2024 presidential race. Here in Maine, the Secretary of State says at least 800 voters were misled into changing their party affiliation when they thought they were signing a petition. Phil, we've talked about this before. Yeah. Are you concerned about this or do you think we're kind of making a mountain out of a molehill? No, I, I think it, it is a reason to be concerned. When, you're, when you are uh, leading someone to believe that they're supporting an idea when in fact you're changing someone's political party affiliation, I think that is a very serious matter and I appreciate you uh, covering it and I compliment the Secretary of State of, to the action that she's taken.
Ethan? Yeah, we agree on this one. You know, very problematic. No labels, sometimes called. You were right on this one. All right, I'll give you <laughs> one on weird. that one too. What's going on here? Um, you know, no labels has been problematic around the country. They're pretending that they are a political party, yet they don't disclose any of their donors. Any political party, as Phil knows, has to disclose who it is that funds them. That's part of our democracy. And what they're doing is simply trying to put a third party on the ballot that's going to help Donald Trump in the end and they're using very de very devious means. Do you agree with that part, Phil? No, I, I, I don't know where the how that helps Trump, but uh, if because you- Because they're gonna put somebody conservative on the ballot, and most of what that's shown is that will take votes, the candidates they've put out there will take votes from Biden, and mm -hmm. that ends up meaning that uh, Trump I, I gets a chance. I think it would take it from Trump. Yeah. All right. Well, while we're talking about the presidential race this week, Republicans in Congress are moving ahead with plans to impeach President Joe Biden. The first hearing is set for Thursday. The chairman of that committee says they even plan to subpoena the president's son and brother's personal financial records. Republican Senator Susan Collins joined us on The Brew this week. Here's what she had to say about it. Uh, since I've been a senator, I've been involved in three impeachment trials, and uh, I don't think that Impeachment is, is necessarily the answer uh, to misconduct, uh, but again, the House is going to do what it has the authority to do, and we're just going to have to see what happens. Ethan, I've interviewed the senator through some of those impeachments, and this isn't new for her. Um, do you agree with what she's saying here? Uh, she was so close to condemning what the House did at the end there, and what she was saying that, you know, these things are perhaps getting a little out of hand and perhaps we are, instead of having evidence and using that evidence in order to move forward with an impeachment, uh, we're actually trying to find evidence. And this is of the president's son and its behavior before he was even president. Uh, you know, when Nixon happened, we had the tapes. When Clinton happened, we had the blue dress. When Trump happened, we had a transcript of a phone call. And then, of course, we had an attack on the Capitol that everybody saw. We had clear evidence in which the, the bodies responsible for oversight saw the evidence and said, now we need to find out what's going on and, and begin an impeachment proceeding. This is doing it backwards, saying we don't have any evidence. Let's go see if we can find it instead of letting the Department of Justice do what it needs to do, which it has been doing. Yeah, Phil, if you're looking at the Trump impeachments, you had the, the constant defense of it's sure. a witch hunt. It's a witch hunt. Sure. Is this a witch hunt? Well, you know, I think uh, President Nixon said it uh, appropriately, the American people should know whether their president is a crook. And the evidence does suggest through shell companies and transfers of significant sums of money to the Biden family, there is enough there there for uh, an inquiry. And I think there should be an inquiry so that we know whether our president is corrupted or not. If he's not, why not just come forward and lay down his hands, lay down his cards. So, is, but, but Senator Collins makes the point here that maybe impeachment isn't the route to take I, and, to uh, do that. Maybe it, maybe it isn't, and, and good for her. I, I admire her class and elegance in this matter. She is, as she said, if it comes to an impeachment, she's gonna be a juror and she should conduct herself with an open mind. And I think that's what you saw her say, is the House has the authority to do this. I'm not weighing in on it because it may come to me in the Senate as a juror. Even I got you out there. Yeah, I, but that, that's the point, right, Phil? It, an inquiry is different than an impeachment, right? right? The Department right. of Justice is already prosecuting Hunter Biden. They've already indicted him, and they're looking into further criminal charges. And if they find anything else, there's an independent counsel, just like Kenneth Starr was an independent counsel, just like uh, the investigations that happened under Nixon and, and uh, of course, under Trump. That's the way you do this. This is, unfortunately, putting the cart way before the horse and uh, it, it has made a mockery a little bit of our political well, system. I, I would disagree a little bit in, in the sense that the Justice Department, as you say, has the authority. They willingly let the statute of limitations unfold so that Hunter Biden couldn't be indicted on s significant income tax evasions. That's, that's not... But what does that have to do with Joe Biden impeachment? That's the point, right? It's fine. You can, you can fault them around their investigation of Hunter Biden and let the House do an investigation. They were. Why has this now gotten to impeachment with zero evidence implicating Joe? Because it reaches a higher level of authority for Congress to compel the president to produce evidence. All right, we're going to leave it there and take a quick break. But don't forget, you can stream the full Political Brute episode on the new Center Main website and mobile app. The Weekend Morning Report is back right after this. Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. I said it before. I'll say it again. We are so glad to be back. I'm joined once again by Republican analyst Phil Harriman and Democrat Ethan Strimling. 
Thanks for being with us. Yeah, good morning, Zach. Good to see good you again. Good to see you. <laughs> I want to start with an ambitious climate announcement from Governor Janet Mills. Transitioning to, to heat pumps in Maine is creating good paying jobs. It's curbing our carbon emissions. It's cutting costs for families. It's making people more comfortable in their own homes. Speaking as part of the U.S. Climate Alliance in New York City this week, Governor Mills and 25 other governors committed to deploy 20 million heat pumps to their states by the year 2030. Ethan, let's start with you. Do you see this as a realistic goal? Sure, very realistic and, and vital, very important. You know, we have got to get to a place where we are reducing our carbon emissions at such a more dramatic pace than we currently are. So it's great that we're ahead of the game already in terms of heat pump. Heat pumps are um, so much more efficient than oil, than gas. Uh, even wood, uh, for sure, in terms of pollutants in the environment. So um, strong praise to the governor for making this goal and for the goal around the country. But, Phil, there are, of course, rebates and incentives. Uh, even still, though, it's not cheap for the average Mainer. Well, I, and I think that's the point. If the government wasn't subsidizing these behaviors, uh, would Mainers buy them? And I'm, what I'm hoping is that we need less and less government support and more competition in the marketplace so that the cost of uh, heat pumps can can come down. And I, I see signs of that beginning, but boy, it needs to accelerate in my view. All right. And from the governor in New York City to Washington, D.C., we're talking about a potential shutdown yet again. Lawmakers headed home for the weekend with no deal. Hard right Republicans really holding up any progress they're accused of anyway in the House, even going so far as to block the defense bill not once, but twice. Phil, this is after Speaker McCarthy agreed to some big spending cuts. Mm. Uh, what gives? You know, I, I think the House Republicans may not realize it, but their infighting debate over how much to cut out of the budget is sending the signal that we're talking about that Republicans want to shut down government. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. What I do believe is that the Congress, particularly in the House of Representatives, needs to do their job of legislating. Uh, I, I have nothing but high praise for Senator Collins, who's on the Appropriations Committee, who over in the Senate got bills through the normal debate and votes out of committee ready to go on to the floor of the Senate. The House should do the same. Otherwise, what we're going to see happen is we're going to have yet another behind the scenes, closed door, omnibus budget that gets put out there that says vote for all of it or the government's going to shut down. That's their job is to legislate do their job. Bill, you mentioned Senator Collins. Uh, she joined us on Political Brew this week. Here's a little bit about what she had to say about the shutdown. Well, in the House, uh, some Republicans joined all the Democrats in blocking uh, the defense appropriations bill from coming to the floor. Um, it has been very chaotic in, in the House and very difficult for the Speaker uh, to manage the situation that he has. He has a very narrow margin. In the end, I think Democrats and Republicans are going to have to work together to make sure uh, that government functions. Easier said than done, of course. And Ethan, we even saw former President Donald Trump has been cheering on uh, those far right House members. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, unfortunate somebody who's running for president would be trying to figure out how to shut down government. and. Um, you know, he's just been a uh, he's he's been a negative force on our politics for a long time, and I think this just demonstrates how negative it is. Uh, hopefully, Kevin McCarthy can find a way through this. And again, I think as Senator Collins said, budgets, especially working together, trying to find a way for Democrats to come to the table. That's that's McCarthy's way out of this. What they're going to pass will never pass the Senate. It's just going to create this mess. Yeah, what's what, what do Republicans have to gain? Here, well, I, I think underneath it all, and this has not been part of the story, is that what we are calling the hard right Republicans are basically expressing their deep concern over our continuing deficits and piling debts. And that's really what they're trying to address. They're not getting their message out very well, though, but that's at the root of what they're trying to say is, look, we cannot sustain the level of spending in the mounting debt of our country. Well, but they, they've got stuff in this budget bill that has nothing to do with that. They got stuff about s woke in schools. They got stuff in here, you know, about abortion policy in the Pentagon. This has nothing to do with deficit. I, if that were the conversation, let's have that conversation, but it isn't. I and, agree. And speaking of Senator Collins, once again, and something with far less serious consequences, the Senate dress code. This headline Susan Collins protests dress code change, saying she will wear a bikini. 
Dare I ask for a reaction here, <laughs> Ethan? <laughs> uh, it was actually a very funny line. I'm glad she, you know, she, it was very clever of her to say it. It obviously got a lot of headlines. Obviously, she's not going to. But honestly, you know, the Senate, they should relax these um, clothing guidelines. They should have done it a while ago. It's up to the people of the country to decide who they want to be and how somebody chooses to dress. If that's really how somebody's going to vote, I can't imagine they will. Uh, that's up to them, so um, I'm glad they relaxed the dress code. Bill? I see it very, very differently. I think there's come a time in our country where you have to honor the institutions and the, the, the history of the, the deliberative body, whether it's in a court or in the, in the legislative body. Uh, you know, I almost jokingly this morning put on a hoodie to wear to the set, but I didn't. I didn't want to. Ins I didn't want to insult the the viewers of the political brew who tune in to hear, uh, you know, a respectful, hopefully, you know, engaging conversation, and to allow the Senate to say to the senators, it's okay for you to dress down in a hoodie and shorts, but everybody who works with you or as a staff person must continue to maintain the decorum of the institution. We need. We, we need to be doing more of this not less. You, you were one of the guys in the Senate who never took your jacket off. I was right? just going to say, even, he's always the best dressed <laughs> I know, he's I know. He's always the well, best and, and out of respect for the institution. Yeah. Even, the, even when it got hot and the president oh said yeah. you could take your jacket yeah. off, he yeah. probably yeah. held it on. Yeah. You know, the rest of yeah. us were like, thank goodness. Yeah. Well, fair enough. But I just think it, it, the, what you wear is not who you are. And uh, what you believe and how you vote for your constituents is what matters. So yeah, it, you're right, Ethan, but we, we're not dressing for Ethan Strimling. Ethan Strimling is dressing for the people of Maine in this august body. That's the difference. And if people of Maine don't want me in the Senate dressed that way, they can vote me out. And if you're wearing flannel, it plays differently. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, what, what, if I, what, if Angus, what if Angus wants to wear a little, you know, a, a nice L.L. L. Bean flannel shirt? Oh, it's so good to be back. Let's wrap things up with winners and losers. Phil, we'll start with you. Uh, my uh, loser of the week is uh, the uh, State Department. They transferred five prisoners from Iraq, uh, Iran, and five prisoners from America, and they kicked in $6 billion. Uh, I don't think that was a, a good deal. Uh, my winner of the week is uh, the Republican leader in the House, Billy Bob Falkingham, who survived his lobster boat swamping before the Hurricane Lee. He survived to live to tell about it. He's definitely a winner. Yeah, it's funny. I had the exact same winner. You know, Billy Bob is, uh, I've interacted with him a number of times. I don't agree with a word that comes out of that man's mouth, but I'm so glad that he survived that. And he was my winner of the week as well. Uh, my loser of the week um, are these people who are these racist Nazis that are you know, Zoom bombing these municipal meetings all over. You know, we need to figure out how to make sure that people can no longer anonymously go on there. It's just cowardice and it's disgusting. So they're certainly my losers of the week. All right, Phil and Ethan, thanks so much. Good to be back. And that's going to do it for this week's Political Brew. Don't forget to catch the new host of Meet the Press, Kristen Welker, this morning at 9 o'clock right here on New Center, Maine. The Morning Report is back right after this.